I'm the co-founder of Kira. Uh, if anyone doesn't know what Kira does, we do machine learning uh, to help lawyers uh, and others do uh, document review, uh, contract review in the case of lawyers, document review in the case of many others. Primarily, we have law firms as our customers, but also big businesses and uh, audit firms as well. So it's it's not only law, but uh, largely largely law. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, doing machine learning if your data is sensitive. Um, so first of all, what do I mean by sensitive data? Uh, so there's many, many types of uh, sensitive data as you can manage, uh, imagine, but some of the obvious ones might be simple things like your name, your address, your age. Uh, but then ones you'll see in the media more often would be things like medical data, health history, your uh, history of drugs you've taken, things like test results. Um, what people don't think about as often uh, is legal data. So, you know, Kira's customers are largely law firms and they have obligations to their clients that they keep their data secret and safe. Um, you know, and that there can be all kinds of sensitive things in uh, le uh, legal data, right? So you can have company names, product names, department names. Uh, in fact, this, this kind of data is so, so sensitive that it, law firms have been subject to uh, attacks from other nation states even, right? There was a case in Toronto uh, years ago where a firm was hacked, uh, I think, by some uh, Chinese hackers. And there was a deal that they were involved in between a company uh, in North America and a Chinese company. And so I guess they were trying to get inside information on these deals. Uh, but also things like, uh, you know, insider trading can be a thing. There's all kinds of reasons people want to get access to, to uh, legal data. Um, so you can imagine that lawyers also are you know, very careful about the security of their data. Um, so what are the specific challenges around legal versus say med medical? So most the inputs to a machine learning model, if I have a machine learning model and I'm just applying it to sensitive data, that's not so bad. There's a lot of straightforward solutions that I'm not gonna enumerate, but uh, you know, you could put your model on premises, you could, uh, do various things to protect it in transit and all this, uh, uh, sorry, protect the data in transit if your model's in the cloud. It's not, not a big deal. Where you start running into really interesting problems is if you're trying to build machine learning models using client data. Um, and, you know, this happens, for example, frequently in the medical area where you're trying to, you know, build some sort of uh, system that can predict or recognize cancer in images, you have to use sensitive data. And this similar in, uh, it's similar in, in legal. You know, there, are, there is some public uh, sources of contract data, things like the SEC in the US uh, forces companies to put out all kinds of uh, contracts and you can use those, but they're not representative of the entire base of, you know, what lawyers have to deal with. So there is a need for them to build uh, build models on top of their data. So aside from things like sometimes they might have to get permission from their clients, uh, they're very unlikely to divulge that client data to a third party. So if you're like, hey, give us that data, my data science team's going to build you some models. No, they, they can't do it in, in many cases, even if they wanted to. Uh, but an interesting, another interesting one is that they often can't even keep the data. They, they have it for the course of a uh, thing that they're doing for a client. And then after that project's over, they are legally required to delete it. And if they're keeping some of that around or some of it that is embedded now in a machine learning model that they're keeping, that's a huge problem for them. Uh, so what are the solutions? Uh, I'm gonna briefly cover these and go into more depth towards uh, uh, the end there with differential privacy. Uh, it's a very interesting technique. Um, but essentially, uh, there's three main things. One is don't look at the data at all. And that sounds obvious, but uh, it's not obvious how you actually build a company when you can't look at your training data. Um, two is learn incrementally. And then three is a, a technique called differential privacy. Uh, and uh, that's really like the holy grail for protecting your training data. Uh, and I'll try and give a rough uh description of how it works without going into all the math. So first of all, sim this one's straightforward. Don't look at the data. Have as few people as possible in your company with access to the data. 
So, you know, at Kira, we have a very small team of systems people that have access to servers. They don't look at the data themselves. They're, they're instructed not to. They have all the security checks and we don't give anyone else access in the company. Uh, no one no one can get out of uh, production, including developers, including our data science team. Uh, no one gets it. Uh, you can imagine that causes us a lot of issues like you know, debugging things when you can't get access to examples that cause bugs and things, you know, but it is possible you can do that. So that's, that's one thing. Of course, this begs the question, how, how can you possibly create a uh, machine learning models for your clients if you can't even look at the data? So what we've done, uh, and I think it, others are doing this as well, and it's becoming much more popular, is that we've built a no-code machine learning solution. Now, first of all, we do provide models out of the box that we have built ourselves on top of SEC data and other public data. Uh, but as I said, that doesn't cover every single thing. So for the rest of it, we have developed this no code machine learning system where basically our clients can create the models themselves without us being in the loop at all. So we never have to see the data or look at the data. Um, now, this has a lot of practical challenges, and I'm not going to go into depth here, but basically you, you'd have to do, you know, automatic data cleansing, automatic hyperparameter tuning. Uh, most important is automatic validation because everyone wants to know, can they trust this model? Um, so to build that all in an automated way does get challenging. And then the, the final one, which I put first, is the automatic hypothesis testing, right? Because sometimes one technique, uh, one machine learning technique might not work well on all data. So maybe you have to try several techniques and then have the system automatically choose the correct one. So those are some of the issues in it, but that, that's one solution. Uh, and there's of course many benefits to, to this other side from you know, solving this privacy problem. Uh, you know, every large customer needs to customize and tweak things. And so this provides a really good way to do that. It provides an excellent way to scale because you can teach the system all kinds of stuff without having to have you know, developers and machine learning PhDs in the loop. Uh, so that, that's a, that's a, there's many good properties of this. So what happens if your clients though can't keep the training data? Fine, you've given them a no code solution, they can train the system, but now they have to delete the data. Well, what if they want to improve the model after they've deleted the data? So for this, what you want to look at is something called, that we call incremental learning. I always used to call it online learning because this is the uh, academic term. So if you're searching for academic papers on this, you can use online learning. Uh, but incremental learning is, I think, a little bit uh, clearer to people who are not familiar with uh, the academic literature. And basically what this means uh, is that you can continue learning from an existing model without train, uh, starting from scratch. Uh, so this works with all kinds of different types of machine learning, from deep learning to classical learning. Uh, many, many, many types can be made into online versions. And there's a lot of benefits as well, aside from allowing people to delete their data, it's better use of resources, it can be a better user experience and so on. So very, very briefly how this works is that if you have trick training data, and you use that training data to produce a machine learning model M1, then you get more training data later. Now we can't use the original training data anymore, right? Say we've deleted it. So how do, what do we do? Well, we take the model one and you take your new training data and together you can actually just update model one producing model two. Uh, and in this way, this allows you to delete the previous training data while still continuing to improve the model. So that, that's an excellent technique to look into that, that can get around some of these issues. Now, of course, the uh, real meat of the problem is uh, you know, the privacy of this model. Uh, and our, our clients are very, very frequently concerned about this. You know, what if the model that gets into the wrong hands? What if our employees look at the model? Uh, can you learn anything by looking at a machine learning model that is learnt from data? Can you learn about that original data? So yes, actually you can. If you, if you decompose a typical uh, you know, model, you can look inside it and you can see all kinds of things. So most machine learning mo models have a notion of uh, features that 
then get assigned weights. Uh, not all have features. Deep learning is a little different, uh, but certainly decision trees, linear models do. If you look inside a de decision tree, you can just see the features, you know, things like, does the patient have a fever? Yes. If Do they have a cough? No, and so on. And so, you know, those features, obviously, you can see in a linear model, too. And most text classifiers that are not deep learning are versions of linear models. These have weights assigned to all of the features, and you can look in there. So maybe you'd see, oh, client A has weight 3.5. You know, the, the phrase assigned to might have negative 0.5, or model 3 has... Uh, 5.0. So you can look here and you can gain insight into what the data was trained on just by looking at uh, these features. And then, of course, deep learning. So deep learning, the vast majority of deep learning methods are all what's called a generative model. So yes, you can do predictions with these models, but you can also run them backwards. And running them backwards basically causes them to generate stuff that looks like their input data. This is exactly what you don't want, right? So you could just, and that you've probably all seen this with GPT-3. You can see it generate all kinds of fantastic, um, you know, articles or source code or whatnot. And these are all literally things it's been trained on. This is absolutely not private. <laughs> um, uh, and then it gets even worse, even without all of being able to look at those, even if I just take the model and I don't open it up, it's actually possible to infer things by a, a something called a prediction attack. So the way this works is you take, in our case, we're doing contracts. So say you have a, a you know, preamble that says this contract is between so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, right? Very simple. So I take that exact phrase and I keep changing the company name and I put it through the model and the model will give me you know, probabilities back saying, yes, this is what you're looking for. This isn't what you're looking for, right? This is a sentence similar. Basically, is this sentence what you're looking for? Yes or no? So maybe if I give it Apple, it'll come back with probability 04. If I give it Google, it'll be 03. Suddenly I give it Facebook and it gives me 0.08. That is now exposing data, right? It's why is it suddenly giving me a high, uh, higher probability than for other words? Um, well, most likely because that train, that word was actually in my training data, right? All the other words in this sentence are the same. That's the only difference. So now I've, I've leaked information. So this, you can imagine, gets really difficult to uh, prevent. So how do you do it? Well, one solution is that you can try and redact the data. This is, the, this is pretty common. This is and pretty popular. So the idea is simple. It's you remove key pieces of information. You can't remove it all, of course, but you can remove, say, sensitive pieces like the name or the person's race or their age. Uh, it's really hard to do this right. If you try the, to do this with an automated method, well, automated methods are imperfect. And if you miss even one bit of information, it's now in there as a feature or it's going to be subject to a prediction attack. Um, even if you get people to do the react redacting, well, people aren't perfect, but also people are hugely time consuming, uh, time consuming, right? So that is a very, very challenging solution. Uh, and then finally, uh, this one is even more mind blowing. There, there's something called secondary correlations that can subvert even your redaction. How does this work? Uh, so imagine that you redact the name uh, and you redact race and say, maybe there's a medical data set or something but you leave the person's postal code because, hey, you know, multiple people live in one with the same postal code. Um, however, didn't think ahead enough and that oftentimes people of a given race will cluster in specific areas. So postal code might highly correlate with race. This is leaking information now. Uh, and if you take multiple pieces of secondary information, you can in fact unmask individuals. So you're probably thinking, well, okay, that's nice. Is this realistic? Uh, and it is. Uh, so in Australia in 2016, they published uh, around 2.9 million medical billing records. Now they were de-identified, aka redacted with either removing people's names or, you know, taking their birthdays and adding some random noise to it. Uh, and then it turned out that researchers managed to re-identify individuals using just a few public mundane facts. Um, the, this is the name of the paper there if you want to look it up, Health Data in an Open World. Uh, for example, if you just use the year of birth of a mother and a year of birth of their child, 
that can be enough to actually unmask individuals in this uh, data set. So it just goes to show how hard redacting really is. It, it's very hard to, to clean deep data in a way that you can use it. So what do you do? Well, um, differential privacy is really the ultimate solution for this. It's a much more challenging solution, but this will protect your data. So what, what is differential privacy? Uh, it's both a mathematical framework and a privacy technique, and it guarantees you a specified level of uh, privacy around your training data. Now, the key thing with this is that differential privacy is specific to the model and technique you're using. You can't just apply it to any old um, you know, uh, model or any old uh, you know, type of machine learning. So there are some popular frameworks for this. TensorFlow has a library that you can use to build into your deep learning systems. Um, Microsoft has open differential privacy uh, that you can use to build privacy solutions as well. Uh, but you know, if, if, depending on what you're using, you may have to invent your own or choose a different technique where you do have a differentially private solution. Uh, so, how, so let's get a little bit more into the details. How, how does this work? So you, basically the, the intuition, and I won't go into the math here because it, it's uh, not enough time to do it justice, uh, but the intuition is that you add noise to a model so that it's impossible to, to distinguish real training data from the noise. So if you recall our prediction attack where I had changed the name of the company, basically if, I want, if you have differentially private solution, it would be the case that random companies that never occurred in the data set would cause you to get a higher prediction uh, probability. Um, so in that way, it protects against um, these privacy attacks. So, but, so more formally, it, the, the more formal definition is that if you take your training data and you change it by a single word, and then you make a new model from it, so you have your original model and you have your new model, the results of those two models should be basically indistinguishable. They should not change significantly. That's the formal definition of differential privacy. It is far stricter than any other technique that you can uh, implement for privacy. So let me take you through uh, very quickly, and this is the last bit of my talk, is the uh, our solution at Kira for doing this. Um, as I said, there's definitely other ways. This is the one we are using for um, more classical uh, machine learning. So it starts with the hashing trick. So you go, what is the hash? What on earth is the hashing trick? So a hash is basically a mathematical function that I can give a piece of text to. So I can give it a feature like model three and it'll give me a number, right? And, and if I give it a different word, it'll give me a different number. Um, now the key is that given that number, I can't easily figure out what that word was, right? Because uh, that, that's the nature of what a hash does. Um, but even more interestingly, different words, say approve, might map to the exact same number as model three, right? This is called a hash collision. Uh, and so on the plus side, this is great because now instead of storing features, I can store just these numbers. And even better, if I give you the number 46, you don't know what the original input was, but even if you did something like, you know, just brute force tried different words until you found 46, well, there's multiple things that can create 46. So you don't know which of those multiple things it is. That sounds pretty neat. Uh, but you might of course uh, be wondering, well, <laughs> hold on, if, if model three and approve both are treated the same, isn't that gonna ruin your accuracy of your model? Uh, well, it actually doesn't. Uh, surprisingly, this is, um, it, despite hash collisions, this works well in practice. Uh, in fact, it has many beneficial prop properties. It can improve the robustness of the model. Uh, it fixes the model size. Uh, now it is true that the size of your hash matters, that function, you have to choose it carefully. And, but nonetheless, it's, it's a wonderful technique. So this sounds great. Sounds that you, know, you can look in our models, you see a bunch of numbers. I can't figure out what those numbers are. So we're done, right? No, 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 not done, unfortunately. Uh, why? Well, the prediction attack, unfortunately, still works. Uh, this thing where it says this contract is between so-and-so and so-and-so, so I can still do, the, do this. Uh, and it turns out that 
you know, things that are in the training data might still give me a higher probability. Um, and so why is this? So this is because the training data, the, the model only contains the hashes for things that it's seen, right? All the other hashes in our case are zeros. Uh, so that's bad. Um, also, the, the th so the things that it hasn't seen don't have the same weight distribution as the things that it has seen. So what's the solution? So the solution is to take all of the hashes for things that were not in the data set and make them look indistinguishable statistically from the things that are in the data set. So you fill it with random noise. And you'll see this is actually a common uh, tactic. All differential privacy solutions use this noising kind of uh, intuition to, to achieve what they achieve. So now it's differentially uh, private. Uh, the, in the original prediction attack, random uh, replacements of words will also score high and we are safe. So just to recap, A, don't look at the data, limit access, use no code training solutions. Uh, B, allow learning incrementally so that users can delete their training data. In the case of law firms, this is crucially important, not so much for other domains, but uh, if your clients are required to delete their da data, well, you've got to delete it. And then ultimately you want to look into differential privacy and that's it. Um, one of the questions we have is from Philip. He asked, uh, how is incremental learning different from transfer learning? Ah, yeah. So, so transfer learning uh, is basically when it's more unique to deep learning. So here's, that would be where I say trained on Wikipedia data. And now I take that model and I want to refine it. Uh, to, to use uh, some other domain, right? Like maybe I'm refining it towards the medical domain by adding extra training data. So that actually is a, um, is a form of uh, incremental learning. Uh, in, in this case, the, the transfer part is actually saying that, well, stuff from one domain gets, the learnings get transferred into another domain. Um, so basically incremental learning is a necessary piece to be able to do something like transfer learning in most cases, not, not necessarily in GTP3. There, they don't actually do uh, incremental learning in order to achieve transfer learning. They, they have a slightly different technique, but, uh, but yeah, it's a form of incremental learning. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we have another question from, oh, it's a, it's a mystery, uh, mystery audience member there. Um, Mr. or Mrs. E has asked, uh, how often does the no-code situation fit the needs of the client? Uh, so that, that varies, right? So in the, in the domain that we designed it for and the kinds of use cases we designed it for, uh, usually it'll be fine. People will have no problems with it. Uh, but certainly if you, we've had a lot of clients use it for things that we had no idea that they would try to use it for, um, you know, documents that aren't actually uh, long form documents, um, and then there it doesn't always work. So the strategy, of course, is when, whenever you find a use case that doesn't work, then you, know, you can talk to the client. And sometimes they'll tell you the kinds of data they're using it for. They, they won't generally give you the, or be able to give you that data, but they'll be able to say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm using it for invoices or something. And you're like, OK, well, I didn't think of invoices. Uh, but at least that gives us uh, enough to go on that we can go and try and find some public data and then build specific techniques uh, that can work for that use case, right? And then you build them into your system so that in the future when users try and learn on that type of data, it'll work. Um, you know, and once you have it working on invoices, then it will of course work on anything that looks kind of like an invoice. It's not, you know, it's not necessarily that specific to its invoices, but more to the structure. Um, so yeah, it, it is hard. One of the reasons it's challenging to build a no code solution. Thank you for that. Uh, we've got another question from Adam B. Uh, Adam has asked, since you would want to protect the model from developers, how are they able to validate the model so it isn't skewed towards a particular outcome? Um, so, so in our case, the validation is all done automatically, but our, our validation is only judging accuracy. Um, we don't actually do anything like uh, bias testing or anything like that. Uh, but in the case of the privacy outcomes, you're just guaranteed by the framework. It, it, it guarantees that it won't be 
skewed towards you know things that weren't in the, in the training data. So that particular type of skew it guarantees. Uh, it, it won't help you if you're if you're trying to make ensure that your model is unbiased or something like that. Those those need other different types of techniques. Uh, our company typically hasn't. Uh, dealt with the bias issue because most of the kinds of contracts people are looking at are commercial contracts, so we haven't run into it yet. Um, but you know that that's a whole whole other talk how to how to deal with that. Nice one. And just just for, uh, curiosity for my sake there as well, Alexander, when, when customers come to Kira, uh, two part, what are kind of the, the problems and insights that they're looking uh, for Kira to reveal? And then on the flip side of the coin, what insights are you able to kind of provide to them? Are you finding that there's specific uh, themes or, or business cases or issues that, that Kira Systems clients are looking to solve? Uh, yeah, sh- sure. So, I mean, I guess the classic example would be uh, mergers and acquisition work. And that, that's kind of where we started. Uh, and uh, that was the initial um, use case that we built the system for. So in a merger and acquisition, you know, your your legal team would be looking for various risks um, for the buyer if the buyer were to uh, you know, buy a given company. So they'll be looking for things like, you know, what happens to your contracts when a change of control, a you know, company A buys company B takes place. Like maybe if you're a soft drink manufacturer, maybe your distributor suddenly gets to renegotiate or, you know, maybe your shareholders, uh, your employees that have options, something happens to them, right? So you, so you need to look through all these different things. And then you, of course, need to know, can I amend the contract if there's a problem? Can I, what jurisdiction is it in? All these basic things. Uh, and traditionally, lawyers will read through, you know, often thousands of contracts to try and uh, find all of these relevant pieces of text. So mm. in our case, the system can read through that and it can highlight and say, you know, this, this provision is relating to change of control. This one's relating to... Uh, you know, exclusivity arrangements or whatever, uh, and it provides that to the lawyers. Um, so why do people train mo- their own models then? Well, sometimes they have their, each law firm has their own particular thinking around what constitutes a change of control. So they might want to create, you know, a law firm specific version of that, that, you know, encodes their secret knowledge, right? Uh, or they uh, might want to, maybe we didn't, build a model for some particular thing that is unique to a case. And so they need to build that. Um, But then, you know, in terms of other use cases, there's other areas of law, right? There's like uh, real estate, there's um, all kinds of things. Uh, Even even corporations have use cases like this. So recently with COVID, a lot of companies had supply chain issues, right? And so they uh, had to look through their contracts um, to, to see if any of their contracts have clauses in them that say, hey, if there's a worldwide, you know, uh, emergency that uh, causes the uh, y- your client not to be able to fulfill the contract, what, you know, what do you get? Maybe you can cancel the contract or, you know, mm-hmm. what, what, who knows? So corporations had to go and quickly look through, you know, oftentimes hundreds of thousands of contracts to, to figure out, well, hey, what, what's going on here? Uh, what are my options? And so that gives you an, an idea of the kinds of things that uh, corporations might be using our software for. 